Okay, here we go. I find myself a bit timid here, having to sufficiently discuss Disney's 1940 classic feature, Pinocchio. My relationship with the film has not always been completely positive. I, I don't think I even ever viewed it when I was younger. It accounts for so much of my hubris. And as a younger adult, it seemed to be a narratively quaint and conservative moralizing fable. I don't quite remember why I dismissed it a few years ago. Well, not dismissed in regard to its animation, really, but just as it being possibly too much of an overly condescending message movie. I don't really feel that way now. It is easy to view with cynicism this film's ethical intentions, its attempted dispersal of wisdom, considering Disney in perspective, even in Walt's lifetime. What is Disneyland if not hollow decadence? You know what I mean, the happiest place on earth requiring as much materials and spending as that seems bizarre from the mind who proposed to realise an animated feature Pinocchio. One can view the film's allegedly family values with a vague contempt. And yet looking at this film purely within the realm of 1940, what a beautiful distillation of humility and gratitude. A really fantastic take on the masculine condition. This strength of the story has become a talking point in recent times, I won't go into it too much. Although I'll admit, this possibly had me projecting a preachiness onto the film, which it really doesn't quite manifest. I think that we can all agree on this film's admirable virtues. Even watching it now, it knocks me over. It exposes one's accumulated memories of a painful pierce. How have we lived up to this film's noble ideals? We're always improving, hopefully. Where I find myself most enchanted with Pinocchio is certainly its animation prowess. Sometimes cited as the peak of traditional 2D animation, Pinocchio's production sought to utilise the profits of Snow White in order to realise some truly challenging visual scenarios, the kind which Snow White hadn't dared. It was determined relatively early in the planning stages that this film would contain an underwater sequence featuring marine life, bubbly textures and swimming motions for its protagonist. This was daunting indeed. Pinocchio's frames depict and illustrate very specific visual details. Note the fastidious attention to light and shade throughout its interior settings, particularly within Geppetto's home. Its conjuring of what quasi-realistic candlelight and moonlight are extremely impressive. This kind of success has rarely been matched since in this manner, and was completely unheard of in 1940. Not even Snow White had showed off such overwhelming talent. There is so much demonstration of carefully considered craft, one of the most consistently enchanting works of animation in feature film history. Occasionally we can point to pivotal animated feature film classics which present each scene or sequence as a brilliant, dynamic, forward-thinking short presentation. It is easy to think about Snow White in this respect, especially given how that film's plot more functions as an excuse for certain scenes. Think about 1988's Akira in this respect, or how about 1999's Toy Story 2? Pinocchio certainly falls into this category as well, I would think. Every facet of this film I consider to be admirable in some way, from a technical standpoint certainly. Every creative visual idea in Pinocchio is impressive in some way, and almost inherently braggadocious. Take even its cutesy elements, for instance. Figaro the cat was Disney's greatest animal yet, and still one of their best in my opinion. Even something so obvious is animated with a grace and character mostly incomparable in this medium's history. It is hard to imagine such passion being generated for a project during this current age of fashionable apathy. I think that sometimes it is tragic how much callousness still exists in a world where in a film like this one is so formative. It's almost more formative in young children's minds than the Christian Bible is anymore, for good or ill, and yet so much ruthless indifference and adjacent sadism seem to flourish in personalities who cite Pinocchio as morally powerful. That is possibly due to those who preach too much moral insistence, usually requiring a group to demonise as inevitably immoral. Sometimes I suspect the desire to demonise and or berate a designated other exists before any ethical impulse. So that's why it's dangerous to go down this path of um, ethical preaching, in my opinion, at least not without very careful considerations of why you're doing what you're doing and of um, how you feel about those who do not share your moral insistence that's almost the most uh, vital and um, urgent issue any ethical thinker ought to address in my opinion is, is how do you not the most but something, something extremely important has to be how do you deal with those who do not agree with your ethics 
those who are unethical by your standards, what do you do with those people? That's important. Yeah. I once suggested, essentially joked, uh, that Aldous Huxley's Brave New World was not a good or effective text by default because its ubiquity hadn't changed a thing about people's behaviour. There were those who sought to decry any pursuit of pleasurable leisure as an otherworldly evil, who cited Brave New World as influential on themselves. And there are those who lived the most barren and empty of hedonistic, eventually I'll feel something socialite, think of me this way, superficial shells of human lives, who at least claim to have read Brave New World. <laughs> so what am I saying here? I'm saying that so many might go pfft toward Pinocchio because they think that those values only matter to delusional children who we teach to believe in Santa Claus and fairies over ten odd years and for no particular reason other than for our own condescending amusement. The fact is, there is no reason to lose one's allegedly childhood optimism. Well, maybe I didn't have that moment or period where I didn't think there was no suffering in the world. You know, when I was young. I, I never... Not to get into it too much, but it never seemed to me like, like the world was like a utopic or beautiful place. Um, from a young age, things seemed to be quite wrong with the world. Um, so when acne hits and adults start treating you like shit for being a poor photo op, you know, I, I still saw cause for hope because I always knew it was possible for things to be potentially really, really bad. Maybe my childhood optimism was different because it wasn't predicated on the world is magical and perfect so much as it was that things ought to be worse, but they aren't, so let's enjoy what we have and try to make things better. In the so-called real world, existence is comically misfortunate, and so one ought never get their hopes up because it might not get any better. It certainly won't with that attitude. Now, a conversely positive mentality is no guarantee for success or triumph or whatever goal one is attempting, but it is certainly gives one more chance than not. If anyone ever tries to bring you down, double down. Use their disappointment as you carry on. Let that motivate you to at least be better than that sociopathic parasite. Don't be afraid. I mean, why bother? If worse comes to worse, you won't even notice it's over. But don't be like me. Be like Geppetto. Geppetto is instructive as a character because his lack of what he wants and his acceptance that it might never come to pass gives him the greatest humility and grace of all. Geppetto was a bastion of uncynical jolliness, and yet everyone around Geppetto would have called him, berated him as delusional, although Geppetto nevertheless chose to wish upon a star for no other reason, no other reason, than it might come true. Hey, you know what's playing tonight? Pinocchio! You guys have never seen Pinocchio, you're in luck! Oh, who wants to see some dumb cartoon rated G for kids? How old are you? Eight? Do you want to be nine? Yeah? Then you're going to go see Pinocchio tomorrow night. Roy, that is a terrific way to win over your children. I'm not serious, I'm just saying that I grew up with Pinocchio and if kids are still kids, they're going to eat it up. Okay, I'm wrong, alright? I'm wrong, Roy. Toby! You are close to death! Come out here! Okay. Let's have a vote. Tomorrow night, you can play Goofy Golf, which is a lot of standing in line and shoving and pushing and probably getting a zero, or you can see Pinocchio, which is a lot of furry animals and magic, and you'll have a wonderful time. Okay? So let's vote. Golf! <laughs> That's a bit of a quotation from Close Encounters there. I'll tell you, if my kids, if my family didn't want to go see Pinocchio, I'd abandon them for aliens as well. No, that, that's a joke. That's a joke. It's weird. It, uh, Close Encounters has been brought up every now and again as a film where people go, what are even Spielberg's family values, really, if, if Close Encounters is what it is? Close Encounters is almost like one of these films where, in, um... <laughs> I didn't even want to get into it. It's like, um, the, you know, the nuclear family's holding you back. You gotta go out on your own sort of thing. You know, it, it, it's, it's a strain. That film's got a strange philosophy. And Pinocchio's referenced several times throughout it. I'll have to do an FOTD on Close Encounters one of these days. Anyway, I, I think that'll do. My, my script is finished. Yes. Have a wonderful day, everyone.